All right. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Pruitt. Today, we're going to be talking about back pain and include some spinal trauma considerations. This is a very common complaint for us, and hopefully by the end of the discussion, you'll have a, a way to kind of make your way through what's going on with your patient and then how to treat it most effectively. Just like always, we'll start with anatomy. The spinal cord is the connection between the brain and the rest of the body. It is protected by the spinal column and divided into four different segments. You have your cervical cord up on the top, your thoracic cord kind of in the chest and the belly area, lumbar is the lower back, and sacral is in the pelvis. Um, if you take a quick look at the way the spine is configured, you can see that the majority of places where people have pain, which would be the neck and the lower back, is where these kind of normal curvatures occur. And you can see that just naturally the bones seem to articulate a little more roughly there, and it tends to lead to pinched nerves in these areas and degenerative changes with age. And just looking at the structure of it, it makes sense why. Those are the areas where the most load is occurring and the most friction and that's where the nerves are going to experience the most signs of trauma. If you look at the bony architecture of the spine you see that the bones that make up the spinal column are fairly complicated. There's a vertebral body and then there's this hole here if you're looking at it from the top and that's where the spinal cord is housed and in between the vertebral bodies we have discs and this adds some padding between the vertebral column in order for the nerves to come out of these other foramina here. So the nerves exit the spinal cord which is protected inside the vertebral bodies and come out right near those discs and we'll talk about why those discs are a big deal a little bit later. But this bony structure is designed to allow for mobility, but it also clearly is designed to protect the spinal cord. You can see that the spinal cord here, looking at this picture, is housed right in between all those bony structures with the nerves exiting in between and the discs adding padding for mobility. Here's a closer look at the spinal cord. The reason our body is so focused on protecting this cord is because it's the communication between the brain and the rest of the body. So this communicates all temperature, all sensation, every motor impulse, and any kind of proprioception, which is the body's perception of where it is in space. So the spinal cord is incredibly important for our functioning as humans and um, for mobility and all of our other interactions with our environment. The nerves that come out of the spinal cord vary in their areas of distribution based on where they exit the spinal cord. So up in the cervical spine, these nerves are going to mostly innervate the neck and the upper arms. The thoracic spine will innervate the chest and the belly. The lumbar spine is mostly the legs and the pelvis. And then the sacral area is the genitourinary area for the most part. So when we consider spinal trauma, this is a very big deal because if the cord is injured, this is going to affect a person for potentially the rest of their life. Cord injuries usually are not reversible and do not get better with time. There's no way to repair a spinal cord injury. So it's very important in the pre-hospital setting where we have really no diagnostic tools other than vital signs in our physical exam. We need to do our best to protect patients who potentially have a cord injury and this is especially important in the cervical spine because the higher the lesion is the more profound the deficits are going to be. Here you see a very unstable c-spine fracture you can see that the vertebral bodies have slipped off of each other they're supposed to be in a nice column like you see here and you see the slip and what's happened is this one's moved posteriorly and actually severed the spinal cord right here. So this person is probably paralyzed, but we don't have a way to diagnose that in the field. We don't have these fancy CAT scans, but what you need to do is understand the mechanisms when you need to suspect this and get that collar on and keep that fracture as stable as you possibly can so that the patient doesn't move and cause potentially more damage to that cord. Cervical spine trauma is definitely the most common type of spine trauma. It's more than half of the traumatic spine injuries that we see 
any time the C-spine is suspected, you need to just assume that it's unstable and get that collar on as quickly as possible. An important point about the cervical spine is that there's very important vessels that transverse through the C-spine. So if there's bony disruption in the neck, just assume that there's also vascular injury. And one important clue to look for, especially in our patients who've undergone a motor vehicle collision, would be the seatbelt sign up near the neck. That could suggest that they had a, a fairly high mechanism impact to the neck. Things that you can look for in your physical exam would be irregular pupils, vision changes, or even sometimes stroke-like symptoms can occur when the vasculature in the neck that goes into the brain is disrupted. Another important thing to remember when you're thinking about cervical spine trauma is that it, the higher the lesion is, the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve, and if there's a lesion to C3, C4, or C5, your patient might be exhibiting respiratory distress. And not all the time is this due to a, an injury directly to the lungs or a problem with the respiratory system. It's actually an innervation of the diaphragm that's making it impossible for the patient to breathe if that phrenic nerve is injured. So another thing to consider, if you have a patient with a C-spine injury, be ready to aggressively protect that airway if you need to, realizing they might not be able to breathe for themselves. Atlanto-occipital dissociation is an injury with an incredibly high mortality rate. Honestly, a lot of our patients that experience this type of injury are already dead before the time we can get there. It's where the skull is attached to the spine simply by ligaments, just like the knee attaches the femur to the tibia just using ligaments and no bony structures. It's the same thing attaching the skull to the rest of the spine. There's ligamentous structures there and if those ligaments break it becomes unstable and what happens is the medulla oblongata and the innervation to the rest of the body is disrupted as well and these patients usually die this can be any sort of force can do this but it's a massive amount of force so you can see you have an anterior force here where the skull is actually exiting anteriorly from the spinal cord any posterior force can do it as well so skull is exiting posteriorly from the spine or even an upwards dislocation as well any one of these directions has an extremely high mortality and the interesting thing is that they're not always clinically visible these patients won't necessarily be paralyzed they just experience sudden death Continuing with our C-spine fractures, a Jefferson burst fracture is a C1 fracture, and you can see here that the C1 ring is very much, if you look at it, it kind of looks like a pelvis. It's a ring, and rings tend to break in two or three places when they do break. The way that this usually fractures is due to an axial load. So you'll see this in your patients who maybe a motorcycle, this too goes through the windshield of another car or someone's head versus windshield or a diving accident where someone dives in and hits their head on a rock or sometimes a rollover accident too where the head impacts the the roof of the car as it's rolling sometimes these patients will only complain of neck pain they won't necessarily have neurological deficits there is a high incidence of associated vascular injury because some some big arteries go right through these foramens here and what you'll see on x-ray is that just like we talked about, the ring just bursts. As the patient experiences that axial load injury, the ring shatters. And depending on where it shatters, there could be that vascular injury with it. So if you have a patient who, whose head has impacted a hard object, make sure you're protecting that C-spine and assessing for vascular injury. Another type of C-spine injury that we see very frequently is a DENS fracture or C2 fracture. I see this most commonly in elderly patients, and it doesn't even necessarily need to be a massive mechanism. Sometimes they just fall and they hit their forehead and their head goes back. This little process here is called the odontoid, and that's where the what helps the head swivel when we turn our neck from side to side. And with age, this becomes a little more brittle. And so in your elderly patients who take a fall and hit their head, remember to seriously consider protecting their C-spine because it doesn't take a lot of force to fracture this little pedicle here. Hangman's fracture is called a hangman's fracture, but really we very rarely see it in hangings. Um, usually where we see it is 
extreme forceful hyperextension. So you can see here this patient's chest and head are impacting the steering wheel, forcing his head back. Just like that CT scan we looked at earlier causes the vertebral bodies to slip over each other and cause this fracture here of this ring. Now the important thing to remember, it's not so much these fractures, these hurt, but also in between there is a spinal cord that's injured as well. So this is highly associated with a spinal cord injury and a patient with this kind of fracture will likely have neurological deficits. Another type of fracture, teardrop extension fracture. This is interruption of one of the ligaments in the neck. You might see this again in elderly patients. It causes something called central cord syndrome. And these patients will also be complaining of neurological deficits. The deficits will be greater in the upper extremities than the lower extremities. And that's one of the ways to recognize this type of injury. Lots of different types of thoracolumbar trauma. You don't need to know them all. Important thing to know here is that as people age, their bones get more prone to fracturing. And here's why. Here's a young, healthy bone. Inside here is where the bony matrix, where all the cells are regenerated and a lot of cellular activity is going on. It's healthy to have these little porous areas, not too close together, but enough um, to provide some cushioning and for some cellular activity. But with age, these little holes are called trabeculae, increase in number and size, and it basically breaks up the integrity of the bony skeleton. So with age, people are more prone to fracture, and this is a especially true in the spinal area, and that's why some people will tell you they get shorter as they get older. Well, that's true because if you look at this young, healthy spine here, the nice sturdy vertebral column is young and healthy. But as people age and these trabeculae become bigger and start to fracture, the vertebral bodies start to compress and actually physically get shorter. So it's important to realize in these elderly patients with very brittle spines, and very brittle necks, especially consider a cervical collar in every elderly patient that falls, whether or not they have neurological damage if they're complaining of pain or they have a mechanism that's suggestive of a spinal cord injury or a neck injury, please place a collar on them. You have neuro exams, mental status checks, and neck pain. It's your discretion to evaluate us and make sure you're evaluating your younger patients as well for cervical spinal injuries, but be especially cautious in your elderly patients. The question arises, what about backboards? We've largely moved away from backboards as an EMS system. We mostly use them to move patients at this point, which is appropriate. Many statements have come out from trauma societies and EMS societies that they're no longer needed and they may actually cause harm. They can cause pain, they cause pressure alters. It makes it more difficult for patients to breathe when they're strapped to a backboard. And so in general, patients can protect their own spine just by laying on the stretcher, but it's still important to use that C collar to protect the neck. So when you're evaluating a patient who has experienced acute spinal trauma, make sure you're considering that mechanism. If they've hit their head or they've had that hyperextension or hyperflexion injury or even an axial load, make sure you're getting the C-collar on there. Check their mental status. If you're not able, if they are not a GCS of 15 and able to interact with you, I would probably place a C-collar as well if they have a significant mechanism. Ask about midline spine tenderness and do a quick neuro exam. The way I like to do a quick neuro exam as you're trying to move fast and identify injuries is ask your patient to give you two thumbs up. If they're able to do that, what that tells you is one, they can follow commands, two, they understand what you're saying, and three, that the most distal ends of their arms are both intact. And so that means everything between their thumbs and their neck is working like it should be. So it's a really nice, quick upper neurological exam. For my lower, to make sure the rest of the spine is intact, I ask them to wiggle their toes. And if they can wiggle the toes, the fact, again, that they're following my commands and then the most distal part of their feet is intact neurologically means everything in general between that is intact as well. Sometimes you might see a patient who's in neurogenic shock. This is going to be difficult to diagnose in the field because this is usually a patient who's undergone significant trauma, and it's going to be hard to tell whether this is neurogenic or hemorrhagic shock. So I would treat hemorrhagic first because that's more common. 
but your patient will exhibit the normal signs and symptoms of shock. So they're going to be hypotensive. They'll probably be warm. But the difference in neurogenic or spinal shock is that these patients tend to be bradycardic and they may or may not be paralyzed. Essentially, when they've injured their spinal cord, they have severed the sympathetic chain. So they have no ability to do that fight or flight response that makes people tachycardic when they're under stress. So that's why they're going to be bradycardic is because they've had a sympathetic chain injury to these nerves that are coming off the spinal cord here. So it's one of the clues that you might see. Even if you're suspecting neurogenic shock, I would encourage you to still treat as if it's hemorrhagic shock. So um, if you have a hypotensive trauma patient, make sure you're evaluating for all the places that they may bleed to death, plug the hole, stop the bleeding, put that pelvic binder on, splint the fractures, and give some fluids for permissive hypotension. If that's still not working and you have a longer transport time, then you can consider neurogenic shock and maybe consider starting a presser. As we're talking about splinting any injuries, again, if you're considering neurogenic shock, make sure you're splinting and using that C collar to protect the C spine from any further damage. You can see here on this CAT scan, here's another bad neck injury. You have your skull up here, your cellar bellum right here. The vertebral bodies have shifted on each other, and you can see that this vertebral body is actually impinging the spinal cord right here, likely causing neurological deficits. You don't want to make that any worse. And if this neck was to move, that that cord would be impacted even, even more so. So in terms of treating acute traumatic back pain, this is a patient where I would definitely treat their pain. If you're suspecting fracture, I would start with fentanyl. This is generally safe and won't have an effect on blood pressure. If you need to and the fentanyl is not working and you have a highly anxious patient, or one where you feel like your narcotics are just not taking effect, I would move on to ketamine. Remember, this is an AAS-only skill, but it is an option in our pain control arsenal. Make sure when you're giving both of these medicines that you're closely monitoring the airway and have these patients on capnography. So what about non-traumatic back pain? I find this to be one of the more complicated complaints because it's very frequent and it's difficult to treat. And frequently people call 911 about this. Well, just because it's chronic back pain doesn't mean it's not an emergency. So these are five questions that I ask every patient with lower back pain. And this heightens my sense of urgency if patients answer yes to these questions. So if there's any numbness in the groin area, if they have new or unilateral leg weakness that hasn't been there before, if they're unable to pee when they want to pee, or they have incontinence of bowel or bladder, or they has, have a history of IV drug use with fever or night sweats or even potentially a cancer history, this makes me very worried that these patients might have a surgical emergency called cauda equina syndrome. And what this is, it's a nerve compression by a disc, which people have all the time, but this is a specially important one. Because the disc you can see here is protruding and actually pushing on this nerve and cutting it off to the point where if they've told you they're not able to pee when they want to or they've lost control of their bladder, bladder or bowels or they're not able to walk, that pressure on that nerve needs to be relieved or that person's symptoms are just going to get worse. And you can imagine that having lost control of your bladder or bowels for the rest of your life is a pretty debilitating problem. So this is a surgical emergency. It needs to be evaluated quickly and um, that pressure relieved off of the spinal cord. And the reason it's called cauda equina, if you look here, here's a, here's a picture of the spinal cord with the bones removed. You can see that the cord itself, it's actually really thick, kind of like a bungee cord. The bones are removed and you can see it here. It usually ends around L2, but there's still a whole lot of nerves that come off of the spinal cord at that area. And it actually, cauda equina literally means horse's tail in Latin. And you can see that it's these really pretty just long nerve roots that come down kind of like, um, like a ponytail. And they can be compressed in the lower spine. Another thing we think about that is another acute emergency with back pain is a spinal epidural abscess. And these are your patients who are more prone to infection. So namely, our IV drug user population, they tend to get abscesses all over their bodies. And one of the unfortunate places that they can get an infection is right inside their spinal cord. And so as the pus begins to accumulate and there's this purulent discharge, it pushes 
on the spinal cord and causes the symptoms we talked about earlier. So these patients will have fever, they'll have terrible pain, they may have neurological deficits as well. So ask about the numbness in the groin, the unilateral leg weakness, and the changes to their bowel or their bladder control. Again, you're not going to diagnose this in the field, but it's something to think about when you're asking your patients there about their medical history. Cancer is another common cause of cauda equina syndrome. The most common cancers that metastasize to the spine are breast and lung and prostate. Those cancers are known to have a proclivity to metastasize to bone. And frequently they go to the spine because it's a very vascular area. And sometimes as the, as the cancer grows, it starts to put pressure on different nerves and, again, can cause this surgical emergency. So make sure you're asking in your patients with back pain about any other neurological symptoms they may be having, especially related to the bladder or bowels. Degenerative disc disease is much more common, and we see this all the time, and it's as patients tend to either be obese or as they get a little bit older, what happens over time before these bones get brittle is they're putting pressure on the discs between the vertebral bodies, and the discs kind of get smashed. And as they get smashed down, whether it's under heavy weight or just over time with wear and tear, as the discs compress, they start to press on the nerves that are exiting the spinal column, and this can cause a lot of pain. Usually your patients will tell you that it's sharp shooting pains that radiate down their leg, and usually it's on one side. Typically, this pain gets better over time. Sometimes it can be acutely made worse by certain movements or even unknown triggers. This is a pain I would treat with anti-inflammatories because that's going to de- actually act on where the problem is and decrease the inflammation right here as long as those NSAIDs aren't contraindicated. On patients with degenerative disc disease and radicular pain is what we call that sharp shooting pain that goes down the leg and a pretty good story for having that happen in the past and they don't have any neurological deficits. This is a patient, like I said, I would treat with ibuprofen or or with Tylenol, I would shy away from any kind of narcotics for chronic back pain that the patients have had before. I really try to reserve my narcotic use for patients who I truly suspect fracture or an acute surgical emergency in. Chronic pain is usually best treated with anti-inflammatories if it's not contraindicated by their medical history. If you're kind of stuck in between the two and you're not sure, ketamine is always a nice option as well. Just make sure when you're evaluating your patient with back pain, it doesn't always have to be the spine, so ask about other things as well. One of the most important things to consider is vasculature. So aortic dissection is commonly known to cause severe pain in the back between the shoulder blades. Usually these patients are a little bit older and have a history of high blood pressure. They may also have a history of smoking. And what this is, it's actually a physical tear in the wall of the aorta. And so they're going to feel a ripping or tearing pain between their shoulder blades. And they may have differences in their pulses, in their arms, or in their legs. You can ask about their history of vascular disease. This is a surgical emergency, so keep a close eye on them if you suspect it. And it's hard to catch in the pre-hospital setting. So one of the formulas I always use to make myself think about this is that if I have a patient, say, who is a 65-year-old smoker with chronic hypertension, and they're telling me that they have chest pain between their back and they're having neuro deficits, maybe tingling in their arm or vision changes in one of their eyes. Any kind of chest pain plus neuro deficit in my mind is a aortic dissection until I can prove otherwise. So make sure you're checking pulses in these patients on both sides and comparing. Evaluate for those neuro deficits. Sometimes depending where the dissection is, there's an interesting finding that some Patients may have a hoarse voice because the nerve that innervates the vocal cords comes right off near the aorta. And if the aorta is swollen or dissecting, it puts pressure on that nerve and patient's voice may change. So that's another clue that they may be having a dissection. Usually this pain is sudden in onset. And if it gets severe and if the dissection is bad enough, your patients may show signs of cardiac tamponade or even hemorrhagic shock.
just something to think about in your back pain patients. One more thing to think about, again, has to do with the aorta. So this is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is a little different than a dissection. Dissection is actually where the blood is dissecting between the layers of the aorta. Aneurysm is really just where there's a loosening in the vessel wall and it starts to balloon out. And as you imagine, just like with any balloon, if it gets too big, it can rupture. This is typically not painful until it gets to the point of rupture. Same risk factors as before, so smokers with a history of arterial disease and bad high blood pressure, usually over the age of 60, are patients to think about this in. And typically this will be a little bit lower, so they'll either have mid-abdominal pain or flank pain in the lower part of their back. The textbooks will tell you you can feel a pulsatile mass, but I've honestly only ever seen this one time, and it was in a super skinny male, so it, this is typically pretty hard to find. And sometimes your patients will have... Um, pain or tingling in their legs is this as the blood starts to pool in the middle of their abdominal cavity they're going to have decreased blood flow to their legs and so they may be complaining of bilateral leg pain another very common cause of back pain that isn't necessarily related to the spine is kidney stone and we actually see this a lot in the pre-hospital setting it's a very painful condition as these stones try to pass. Sometimes the stones run in families. Sometimes your patient will have a history of dehydration or eating too much protein. Usually presents with kind of colicky, which means just pain that comes and goes in waves. Usually in the flank, it causes frequently nausea and vomiting. Patients will become very sweaty and pale and be writhing in pain. It's really hard for them to sit still because it's so painful. This is a patient where if you suspect this, Tordal typically has been taught that it's very effective for this, but if you have a patient that's in this severe of pain, I would probably not hesitate to give them narcotics too until you can figure out what's going on just to get them more comfortable and be able to um, help you get the rest of your assessment done. So in terms of back pain, we covered a lot of different things today. I don't expect you to know all these different types of fractures and things that we covered, but I do hope that we instilled a respect to use the C collar in our elderly patients because they are prone to a lot of different types of fractures that can be very debilitating if not stabilized. Vital signs are very important. Make sure you're getting a good neuro exam on anybody with a spinal complaint. Evaluate your acute versus your chronic pain patients and then treat them appropriately. If this is acute and you suspect a fracture or surgical emergency, don't be afraid to use your narcotics. But if it's not and it's chronic and there's no scary neuro findings, it's okay to use your NSAIDs if they're not contraindicated. And make sure you're asking about those red flags of any bowel or bladder problems, any history of cancer or fevers or IV drug use, and any numbness or tingling in the groin or new weakness. Those are all things that might point to a higher acuity complaint. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I know I'm happy to talk about this further, or you can ask your 7-8.